Caracas, Venezuela. We're on our way to film a people whose way of life our civilization will slowly destroy. Our guide is a French anthropologist, Jean-Paul Dumont. I have lived a uh, couple of years with the Panari Indians <coughs> uh, as an anthropologist, and though I have studied them for that time, I cannot say I really know them, especially with, with these people. It's very difficult to pretend one know them. Uh, I really don't know what kind of reaction they are going to have to us as a team. It's only three days quite easy drive from Caracas to the Panare Indians. When we got there, this is what they were doing. Precisely what it is, the Panare won't tell. One of them did say that he'd painted his body with the footprints of jaguars and centipedes, but the Panare aren't usually that forthcoming. Ultimately, they reject everybody who is not one of them. have always resisted my penetration of their culture and they have always refused to tell me anything about their spirits or about their religious beliefs. If you ask them about their beliefs they don't answer at all or they tell you to go to hell. <laughs> I have been living in among the Panori Indians for a couple of years, <clears throat> most of the time in this particular village. And uh, although they are not threatened in the same way that, for instance, in Brazil, uh, Indians have been shot with guns and so forth, uh, at least uh, the Panori Indians are threatened culturally, that is to say their, their existence as a society is uh, is likely to disappear in a mm, few years. This is very sad, but there is really nothing I can do for it, except uh, making a document on a way of life while it still exists, and show how the culture do function while it's still functioning. The Panare live in scattered villages on the north edge of the Amazon jungle. They get up with the sun, usually the women first. On cold mornings a wife will put a bowl of hot ashes under her husband's hammock to warm him, before sweeping up and emptying the rubbish. The Panare village is one family, about 50 people. Everybody is related to everybody else. Parents, children, uncles, cousins, aunts, grannies and even great grannies. Every morning, this sound used to wake us. 
The man isn't an Indian, he's a Creole, a Spanish-speaking peasant, a mixture of European settler and African slaves. He'd chosen to take off his clothes and go and live with the Indians. They tolerate him and feed him and work him hard. What they do with their day depends on how much food they've got. If they have any, they eat breakfast in the morning. Each village has a sort of head man. Here, it was Unye with one of his sons, Tena. <laughs> Tenare headmen have no authority and not much influence over the other Indians. Unye is headman because of his age and because he is a shaman, the holder of supernatural powers. <laughs> <clears throat> the Panare have no ranks or hierarchy, no concept of a class system. Unye acts as a sort of chairman when they discuss things. He cannot compel anyone to do anything, but his status does get him close to the food pot. Their whole society is based on a different principle. Our society is held together by laws and by punishments for breaking those laws. They have no laws, no punishments and no system of authority. Their society is held together by the ties of kinship. If they have food, after breakfast they go back to their hammocks and do nothing. If they don't have any, they spend the day getting it. Tuna and his one wife go into the garden, most of the other men to hunt or fish. The Panare hunt with blowpipes. This was Nachter making his darts. Most of the men were utterly indifferent to us, but Nachter was usually happy to show us what he was doing. For poison, they used curare, which kills by paralyzing the muscles of the breathing system. The wad is not cotton. It's the inside of a sebo fruit. When he needs some, Nachter takes his two wives and all his children and every possession he owns off into the jungle until he finds it. It can take him weeks. With his blowgun, he can kill at 200 feet. The Panare live basically off a garden cleared out of the jungle. Each man and his immediate family have an area. The garden gives them yams and manioc, bananas, sugar, cotton, potatoes, peanuts, hot peppers and tobacco. Even at midday, the village is never left empty. On most days, there's cassavi to be made, a sort of flat bread made from bitter manioc, the plant that gives us tapioca. Bitter manioc juice contains prussic acid, poisonous enough to kill you. To extract it, they make the manioc into flour by grating it and squeeze the poison out of it in long, flexible baskets before they cook it. Every day, for generations and generations, the Panare have been doing the same thing. They have no days of the week, no dates, no years, no age, and no concept of history. Perhaps because history records changes, and they have changed hardly at all. The standard explanation for this is economic.
that tropical forest villages cannot produce enough of a food surplus to free anyone from the yoke of daily food production. And without such an opportunity, the society can never develop. Before anyone can be a carpenter or a king or an artist or a priest or a house builder, someone else has to produce enough food to feed him. The Panare have no such specialists. Between them, a Panare man and woman can do every job the society knows. Everybody hunts and cooks and weaves and gardens and makes weapons and music and paints their bodies. No one gets fed. You provide your own food or you starve. With them, that's how it's always been. In their kinship structure, we had no place, and it wasn't long before they started the process of rejecting us and hiding themselves from us. After three weeks, it became almost impossible to film them. As they withdrew from us, it got harder and harder to find out what was going on. In the middle of one very hot day, we heard what sounded like a baby. It was a new one being washed by its mother. No one had told us. For them, it didn't seem much of an event. Most people were out working, and that afternoon the mother too was back in the garden. It was her first baby. <coughs> the baby seemed to have more significance for his father, Magnon. Soon after the birth, Magnon drank an emetic made of tree bark to make him sick. We couldn't get the meaning. Possibly the Panari themselves no longer know, and do it because their fathers did it, like the Christian baptism. Like the water in baptism, it may be a symbol of inner cleansing.
what's amazing with the uh, Panara Indians is that in spite of the contacts they have regularly with peasant culture or a Western type of culture, they have not adopted this uh, type of life. And they have not changed, basically, their traditional way of life in spite of very little small changes in terms of tools or things like that. For the last 50 years, the Panare have lived in almost daily contact with the Creoles, the Spanish-speaking peasants who work as wage labourers on the cattle ranches of South America. The Panare go to the Creole villages to trade for iron pots, for fish hooks and line, for aspirins when there are any, and for the occasional bottle of Coca-Cola. Basically, they despise each other. But if the Creoles despise the Indians, it's not half as much as the Indians despise the Creoles. Sometimes, when the Indians are feeling bored, they take the day off to go and laugh at the Creoles and the way of life they find so extraordinary. The Creoles have been left behind by Western progress, the dregs at the bottom end of the Venezuelan economy. Oil makes Venezuela hugely rich, but not much of it reaches the Creoles. It's for them and their problems that the guerrilla fighters and their ideals of equality are getting ready in the hills all around where we were. The Indians have no such conflicts. Within their society, everyone is equal and no one has cornered the wealth. When the Creoles and the Indians finally meet, two different races, languages, religions and ways of looking at the world meet. One which came with the European settlers and African slaves within the last 300 years, the other from the mainland of China in the last Ice Age. Cinco reales. Cinco reales. The day we went, they'd gone to trade for aspirins, the only medicine they or the Creoles are likely to get their hands on. They got six. Sickness soon destroys any impression of a romantic life. It was Tenin, the chief's son, and aspirins weren't going to cure him any more effectively than his father's shamanism. Mm. 
I proposed to him to bring him to the hospital, take care of and he does not want. I don't know what we're going to do with him. Uh, he's probably going to die here. I The next day, Tuna and his father changed their minds, and we drove them non-stop for 19 hours to Kaikara. As the kinship loyalties demand, Nachter, his brother-in-law, came to be with him. None of them knew exactly what they were going to, or what the hospital was. Tana was the first Panare Indian ever to see the inside of a hospital. Sickness is the one thing that leaves the Indians helpless. One day, we found a whole village with flu. They'd brought their hammocks out into the open to keep cool. Indians don't have much resistance to our diseases, and simple flu kills off more Indians than anything else. Fever makes them hot, they swim to cool off, they catch pneumonia and they die. We gave them what medicines we had, but it's probable that the majority of these people are now dead. After a day or two in the hospital, tonight was all right. Uh, the great mistake about the Panara Indians would be to think that as they look for medical help and medicines, they want to have this so-called advantages of our society, like cars, like schooling, and etc. It's not at all what they are looking for. But I think the medical help would be the only real help our type of society could bring to them. <laughs> It takes more than one visit to a town to stop Indians from being Indians. On the way home, they told us to stop at a bridge. The whole Indian society, their whole way of life is so different that you cannot judge it by the standards of our Western civilization. <laughs> the Panori Indians live in a state of balance of equilibrium with nature, and this is something that we have lost. There is no point in giving them what we think of as advantageous. Things like better housing, because it may be better for us, but for them it's totally meaningless. It's exactly the same with clothing. What kind of possible advantages about clothing? It's just cultural imperialism to consider that Western clothes, the clothes of the people of the city, are the best clothes. The Indians wear loin clothes, which are their clothes. When they'd finished, they took the meat and left the skin behind. It tasted rather good. It's just the same so far. 
as schools and schooling are concerned. If we say we want to give education to the Indians, what we are saying is that we want them to change their whole way of life. These uh, Panora Indians uh, live in a total harmony with their environment. That's why would you like to project our ideology, that is to say to impose upon them, schools which are obviously a, a, a type of organization which is, exists within our culture and which exactly uh, makes uh, people educated in one way. The Indians have an education of their own which is perfectly suited for their society. They teach their children how to hunt and fish and act within their society. But why impose our way of life upon them through schools, especially when the Indians resist the imposition so strongly? For 50 years, they've lived in the same village. In that time, they've acquired almost no possessions, not even the cattle or pigs or horses that they see every day with the Creoles. When they go off into the jungle or to another village, they take every object they possess in a basket on their back. Anything which won't go in that basket, they reject. They produce everything they need without working long hours. If they chose, they could produce a surplus of things like tobacco, and they could sell or butter it for money and possessions. But they don't. They like their leisure. For them, money and possessions have much less attraction than swinging gently in a hammock. Even if the Indians were to chant, the only change possible is for them to become Creoles. And what, what does it imply to be Creole? Look at these people living 15 kilometers away from here. They have no advantages whatsoever of our Western society. They have a school without any uh, mistress. They have an infirmary without any nurse. If they have any sick problem, they will die of it. Most of them have no lands of their own. They have just a little garden in which they can survive with the uh, garden products. So I don't see any advantages of these people. So that's the only choice possible for the Indians. Either they stay the way they are, or they change for being Creoles. In the early evening, three miles downstream from the Creoles, the women start to cut up the fish and taper meat the men have brought home. Now, obviously, this does not mean that Panori society do not change, the Panori culture do change, but the kind of change you have is only a change which is acceptable for the Panori culture. For instance, they have taken in the last 50 or 60 years iron tools, which helped them in their works, thus uh, giving them more free time and so far. The Panare only accept change within their system. We allow our system itself to change constantly. Western development has brought us a great deal the Panare don't have. It's brought us technological and artistic achievements and mastery over our environment. Out of it has grown some concept of individual freedom. But our development hasn't been the same for us all. It's brought differences of class and wealth, the rulers and the ruled, and all those concepts like democracy and repression that presuppose conflicts of interest. The Indians have no such conflicts of interest. It makes them strangely content, like cows in a field. Perhaps the best way of explaining the difference between us and them is that in the Amazon jungle they still haven't found the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Comparisons don't mean much. Theirs isn't a lovely life. There are plenty of unpleasant things about it and about them. But if you take some criterion like happiness, you wonder a bit just precisely what our progress has gained us. By the end of the day, each man and his wife has produced a pot or two of food. When it's cooked, they take it to the common meal, the man to his, the woman to hers. It's then that what the individual has worked for all day is shared out communally. <laughs> <laughs> the whole question of change and the Indians is really more simple than it may seem. If the Indians want to change, that's absolutely fine. But what's all wrong is for the government or for the missionaries or for me to impose any kind of change upon them. <laughs> Three days away through the jungle, at a bend in the Shapuri River, the first real change is coming to the Indians. And it's this place that will almost certainly mean the end of the Indians as they now are. It's a Catholic mission station, where one Indian boy, called Jan in Spanish, is being taught a new way of life and smothered in love by three kind and gentle ladies. Whatever Yan may be, he's no longer a jungle Indian. Yan may turn out to be the Messiah who will lead his people into the way of life they cannot avoid forever. or it may be him that will lead them into the slums of South America's cities. The Venezuelan government now hope to incorporate their Indians into the rest of Venezuelan society. The Panare don't know that they have a government or that they live in Venezuela. They're not aware of any impending change. As we left, they were hacking into the jungle to extend their garden, as they've always done every spring. 